Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're super excited to have you here in our series on financial sustainability. Um, welcome, and uh, we're going to run through some of these slides here with you. We have an amazing speaker and presenter today. Uh, Ray Vix is here with us, and I'll introduce him just shortly here in one minute. Um, first, if you don't know who we are, a uh, little, little bit about SCORE. Um, we have over 300 chapters nationwide. We are part of the SBA. Our little chapter here in, in Minnesota, which is Manatee and Sarasota counties, is over 50 years old. We have over 90 plus volunteers, and we are an amazing chapter. We love to provide educational workshops as well as mentoring to businesses. So if you are in need of any kind of services for your business with respect to growing and starting a business, um, or if you're in the growth stage of business, we are here to help. Um, we're definitely skilled and well-versed. Our chapter has a lot of amazing retirees here in Florida. So we are very, very blessed and fortunate to have some real assets uh, here within our chapter. And uh, one of them today is Ray Vicks, and I'll introduce him to you. But if you're interested in starting a business, researching and planning, opening a business, growing your business, or even exiting your business. We have an exit strategy team here at SCORE Minnesota. So we're happy to help you. If you're interested in getting mentors, please visit our website and learn more about that. We could obviously, uh, we couldn't do this without our sponsors and we definitely want to thank them uh, for their continued financial support for us to present these workshops and also have so many wonderful volunteers to bring to you. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce to you Ray Vix, and Ray is going to talk with you today about surviving and thriving in, in 2021 and really dive into the financial aspects of that and looking at financial statements. So Ray, thank you so much for for volunteering to join us today. If you wouldn't mind telling folks a little bit about yourself and um, why you became part of our amazing organization. Well, thank, thank you very much, Paula. Um, you know, let's start with our organization uh, score. You know, for me, you know, this is really an opportunity to connect with what's a new community for me. You know, when I retired, I moved down to Southwest Florida just two years ago to this uh, Lakewood Ranch area, you know, the Sarasota Manatee County area. And I, I did want to get involved in the community, you know, for, for me and given my background, the small business community is a natural. And the fact that, you know, I provide a lot of advisory type of service types of services to businesses uh, to be able to work with small businesses is really um you know, it's more than an opportunity. It's a privilege for me. Uh, I also work as a mentor to um, high school and middle school students. So that's, that's also very interesting. And it's a different type of a challenge and just as much fun. So uh, I do look forward to what we do with SCORE. You know, I've been impressed uh, with the small business community here in Southwest Florida. And so, you know, I look forward to being able to do these types of uh, presentations and to get to know uh, you better. That is, we and we appreciate you too. And this is, you know, such a familiar story for a lot of our volunteers that come down here and have just an amazing amount of expertise uh, to share with our community. So we greatly appreciate your volunteerism and, and sharing yourself as a resource to the community for sure. So thank you so much, Ray. We appreciate that. So let's jump right in here. Great. So, you know, I, I like to start this discussion really with a focus on you as the participant, why should you care? Uh, and I think, I, I guess the first qualifying question would be, do you receive financial statements assuming you're not the finance person? And if so, how often uh, do you review them or, you know, are they, you know, just something that, you know, you receive because it's a habit. Uh, do they include comparisons to budget? That's important. Um, do they contain what we will refer to as key performance metrics? We'll come back to that topic later, or KPIs. You've probably heard about those. 
Uh, how familiar are you with the key terms that are contained in your financial statements? And really, could, could you could you speak to the financial status of your business this month? You know, beyond just the intuitive thought, how's the business doing? And so that's those are the types of things that we'd like to explore when we're talking to a group of business owners. All right, so the old mantra, show me the money, right? Know your financial status. There, when, when the entire day is over, I think the linkage around financial status is to cash and to cash flows. So hence, show me the money. Where'd it come from? Where'd it go? Where is it now? I think you know your performance as an owner is reported in your financial statements. Uh, whether it be your banker, your partner, your fellow investors, maybe even major suppliers, you know, generally they're measuring the success of your business by examining your financials. And so if you and if you really think about it, you know, your financial statements really, you know, it's just recording the uh, things in your accounting uh, systems and then summarizing those. So that's the key thing. Keep in mind the financial statements is a summarization of what you've already recorded. So really, this session is about speaking the language of financial statements, really the language of business. So uh, I'd like to uh, dive in. We talked about this. I think a key thing here is once you understand the basics, the, what you're really after is the ability to deploy your financial statements in what I call a strategic tool uh, for you uh, in running the business. So what do financial statements show, All right? And we, if you talk to people, most people will say there are three basic financial statements. I, th I think that sometimes you see a fourth, you typically see a fourth. So I like to list it, which is called the statement of changes in equity. But let's, let's just quickly uh, e explore these captions here because you've probably heard some of them. You know, an income statement, you, you hear it referred to as profit and loss statement, P&L. Uh, it's going to have the revenues and sales, the expenses. It's going to come down to the net income. It, it's, it's, it's probably the most widely used and known statement. Followed immediately by the balance sheet, also referred to as a statement of financial position, particularly, in, you know, in the not-for-profit community, it's called that. Uh, here, here you're going to have your assets, liabilities, and then, you know, the equity, which is essentially the owner's investment and the retained capital. Uh, we mentioned the statement of changes in equity. It, I, essentially, it's a roll forward of equity categories from period beginning to period end. We're going to look at one and talk about it quickly because I think as an owner, it is an important statement. And then the statement of cash flows, again, as we said from the beginning, it's about the cash. T typically that's divided into three key categories based on types of activities. Some are operating, that's running the business day to day. Some are investing, that, that's, that's essentially how you deploy funds into the business. And then, and then the financing section, I think that's uh, self-explanatory. You know, where, where do you uh, source your funding? Okay. So let, let's, let's just cover a couple basics around the income statement. Um, a, a, a key differentiator with it is that it's prepared for a period of time, whereas your balance sheet and some of the other statements are a period in time. Okay, so this is important, a period of time. You know, whether it be a month, quarter, year, et cetera, it's, it's sort of an accumulation of activity. I think that the types of captions in it, you probably heard, you may not be completely familiar with them uh, uh, as a financial uh, 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 state uh, uh, item, but you're familiar with those when it comes to running the business that you're in. Uh, I, I think a, a thing to keep in mind is that for startup organizations, you're typically going to start with financial projections, then you're going to follow that with budgets, and then ultimately you're going to have a statement of operations after the business is up and running. But the concept for a, 
for, for the um, income statement really predate the business and predate its operations because these are the types of concepts you're going to develop as part of your business plan for a startup and that you're going to take to potential lenders and investors for the company. This, this statement answers the question, am I making money or not? Or is the business projecting the types of financial results that would attract investors? Okay. So let's let's walk. Sorry for this. This is this is just a reality check. You hit you with the bright uh, yellow lights. But um, let's let's um, let's take a quick minute and explore this income statement from in the way that a finance person would, particularly a, an accountant or a CPA. So I look at these guys. Yeah, there are numbers here. But first thing I say is this is a manufacturing company, and and the clues to that are that I look in the cost of the goods sold section, cost of goods sold, and I can see that it's a pretty substantial amount of spend there relative to revenue or sales. And I also look and I see, and, and there's significant materials and labor involved in this. So obviously they're producing a product and manufacturing it themselves. But I also look and I say, but the labor component is fairly low relative to the com materials component. So I say they, they probably have a partially finished material that they receive and then they complete it in their inventory production cycle to get to a finished good. So, so that, that's the nature of this company that I see when I look at these numbers more so than the numbers themselves. Uh, I, I look at their SG&A expenses SG&A, from a terminology standpoint, those are your selling, general, and administrative expenses. Th these are what you call the more controllable expenses. If you're an accountant, you know, they're both variable and they're fixed. But generally, to the extent as an owner or manager, you can control these SG&A expenses, you know, the, the, that, that control drops right to your bottom line. That gets right to the pre-tax income, to your margins, Etc. So it, it's a big focus in KPIs how these SG&A expenses are managed. Um, so so this particular company, we're going to get into KPIs later, but just as we eyeball this a bit, they, they generated 62, 63,000 in pre-tax income. That's about 12 and a half percent. Their net income's at about nine, nine and a half percent. The implied tax rate's about 25 percent. Th those those were fairly good results for a manufacturing type company would be, would would be my initial thought after kind of strolling through their uh, income statement. All right, let's go to their balance sheet. All right, remember now, different from an income statement, a balance sheet is at a particular date. Okay, so it's like a snapshot. It's a picture right at a certain time. So a balance sheet might be as of December 31, 2020. All right, the, these, are, these are assets. Your balance sheet contains the assets, which basically it, it's what the company owns. And the, and the question is, how were they paid for? Because that's going to balance this accounting equation. All right, so assets are typically paid for from the owner's investment, uh, borrowings essentially, or, or financing those. Uh, uh, you know, current year earnings can, can be involved in, in immediate purchases and then prior year's uh, retained earnings. So, so essentially that balances the equation is that you own these assets, they were acquired either through debt or your investment Hence the accounting equa equation, assets equal liabilities plus equity. You'll hear people say you have to have a double entry. There has to be a, a, a debit and a credit in any accounting entry made, and that's true. You have to maintain the integrity of that closed equation. All right, so we're walking through a balance sheet here now. We've got, um, in this case, you know, you can see the 351,000 of total assets that equals total liabilities and capital, as we mentioned. Uh, just thinking about this company, some, their current assets are 96,000, you can see. Their current liabilities are about 35. 
that that's pretty good liquid liquidity. You know, they they have the you know essentially they can cover their current liabilities three times with their current assets, if you will. But a note of caution I'd have if I looked at these guys because I'd say, well, okay, they've got forty thousand tied up in accounts receivable, so they're their customers are buying on credit, but they've got more than 10% of their assets tied up with customers, uh, you know, who, who, who have received the goods already, but they haven't, you know, uh, paid yet. Uh, they also have quite an investment in inventory. That, that doesn't bother you too much because as we mentioned, they're a manufacturing company. Okay, as, as you continue to look down there though, you say they're, they're also very, what you call capital intensive. I think when I looked at it, they have about 250 of fixed assets, which is which is more than 70% of their total asset position. So if you looked at that, that means they're capital atten- intensive, you know, a, a quite an investment in what you call hard assets as opposed to intangibles. Okay, now if you look at their debt, though, they have used, you have to actually, there's a little acronym up there, CPLTD, that, that's the current portion of long-term debt of about 3,000. And then you see their long-term debt below, that's another 15, so that's 18. And then they have mortgages of 115. So overall, they've used about 133,000 of financing for their fixed assets that equal 250. And that's good leverage. It's not overdone. It's not underdone because it allows the owner to the owner to have on an investment of a hundred thousand to have accumulated three hundred and fifty one in assets. So that's good use of leverage, assuming rates are interest rates are fair. Okay. Okay. All right. And, and I'm I'm just kind of blowing through this. I mean, figuring that we can do Q and A and we can talk you know, with any questions that you might accumulate as we go. If, if if at any particular point in time you say, okay, just stop for a minute, I can do that too. So I can stop and we can talk about things. But 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 let's let's look at the statement of changes in equity. Um, I mentioned this is if you have three basic financial statements, that this could be called the fourth because it's usually presented separately. It, it could be embedded as part of a balance sheet or as part of a PL statement, it's just awkward. So most companies will produce it separately. And essentially what it's showing you is it gives you some insight into what happened through that period in the owner's equity section. It gives you a sense of the ownership structure. Uh, is it a partnership? Is it a C-corp? Uh, are there multiple classes of stock? Um, ha- to, to the extent the company earns monies, are they returning those as dividends and other payouts to their owners, or are they being retained in the company? All of that type of insight can be derived from a statement of changes in equity. So here, here's an example of one. Okay, and so let, let's do, let's do a quick walkthrough like we've been doing. As we mentioned. You know, the, uh, if you look at the upper left part of that uh, statement, the owner initially invested 100000 If you look to the very lowest right side, when, when this period's over, this, this owner now has 186000 So, you know, obviously, you know, the, the equity position in this company has grown from a book standpoint. It, it, it could be even different. It could be higher or lower from a market standpoint if you were looking at equity, but from a book standpoint, there's been 86,000 in equity growth. So you say, well, what's that about? And essentially, in this case, they had th- th- this owner has retained 39,000 of income from past years. That's what's in that retained earnings column. And then they had another 47,000 of net income this year that they're also retaining in the company, okay? So in this instance, they return no capital to the owner, nor did they give a return on capital. So, it's, it's, so, 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 the, so they neither gave dividends or 
gave back capital to their owner. So, so, uh, so they're purely in an invest in the business stage at this point in time. Now, no, just, just for the record, that accounting corrections column, we don't want to get technical here, but if there were an accounting change or an error that happened in past years, this is where it gets corrected so it doesn't distort the current year's P&L statement. Okay, let's 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 move away from there and go to the statement of cash flows. Uh, th th this statement gives you a lot of your liquidity, and I call also solvency information. I mean, when the day's over, absent cash, businesses don't thrive. So th this is what it's about, in in, in my view, at least. Um, it, it gives a lot of insight that can allow you to do projections of of what you expect in future cash flows. It, it gives some insight into management's decision-making when it comes to how it wants to source cash and use it. And, um, and, 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 I, and, and what I like about it is that it's th these, these three categories are required under the accounting rules, but they make an awful lot of sense because you've got these operating activities and the question is, how, how did you finance the business? And to the extent you had excess cash, how did you invest it? So, so it's, I think it's a statement that really gets to the core questions around running a business. Okay, so we'll walk through this statement quickly. We, we can do questions on it. This, this statement can sometimes cause some stress just because you know the, it seems like there are a lot of moving parts but but I it's fairly straightforward if if you go so first of all what we're going to do is we 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 want to understand what was our net cash flow for the year whether it be a positive or a negative what was it and then we want to be able to understand that by putting it into the three buckets that we described, operations, investing, or financing. That's all we're doing here. Everything else is just mechanics. Right in the middle of the page, you'll see we come to a net cash from operations. So if this company had operated and reported all of its activity only on the cash basis, in other words, it didn't use accounts receivable, it didn't use accounts payable, it's just all cash, then they generated 49,000 in cash. At the same time, they, I'm going to jump to the financing section. At the same time, they borrowed 140000 and then they made some investment. So I look and I say, all right, they borrowed 140000 and I can see they essentially invested it in equipment and building. Makes a lot of sense for a manufacturing company. And, and it also makes a lot of sense that they, that rather than using operating cash flows, to finance long-term assets like equipment and building, they use long-term debt, which is probably priced pretty reasonably in terms of interest rates. Fair enough. So, so when you use that statement, you can use if 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 you if you forget the mechanics of the statement and think about its intent, you can use it to both analyze the business very quickly and also make business decisions going forward. This leads us right to the area where we'll wrap up and, and get into um, how do we really use this information once we get comfortable with it. Financial performance ratios. Now, financial performance ratios are a subset of key performance ratios or KPIs because you're going to have ratios other than just purely your financial performance, obviously, to run the business. But, but we have a few here that I think the four that we have here are probably the most typical that you're going to see because they, they, these are all what I call profitability ratios. And I, I always say, you know what? There's a no pain, no gain type of a thing here. The pain is in understanding how these financial statements fit together. The gain is the only benefit you get from that is putting that to use through these KPIs. So to the extent you can use those KPIs strategically or as management tools, then you, 
Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to go through the pain of understanding your financial statements, right? But you're also getting a gain uh, out of that that's beyond uh, just producing your statements because the banker asked for those. All right. So let's uh, let's take a quick look at these. I'm going to the, these are fairly uh, self-explanatory. All right. So cost of sales to sales in this company, it's about 64 percent. That it th this is a manufacturing company. So that's reasonable. If this were a services company, that that would probably be too high to have the cost of sales that high because you're not you know, because of the nature of the business. These also can vary by size of business, geography, and a number of other reasons. The key thing is using it as a tool, right? You want to monitor this periodically, probably monthly at best. You want to compare to previous months, but also to the same month in other years so that you get a sense of your seasonality and things like that. Um, and you want to use it as an early... Um, uh, warning um, indicator where you look at it and you have an expectation in mind. If you expect this to be 65% and you're running here at 64 and a half, okay, fair enough. All right, th this is the reciprocal, you know, uh, of um, the previous one. It And so it flips side, right? What's your preference? Do you prefer to look at your growth profit as a percentage of sales or your cost of sales as a percentage of sales. Doesn't matter, it's measuring the same thing, which is essentially, uh, it's a profitability metric. But everything that I mentioned for the other applies to this one. We're, we're essentially showing it because it's one of the four that you typically see. So let's go to the uh, selling, okay, the SG&A. All right, now, as I mentioned before, so this one, this company's running about 23%. And I would say that's good, it, given the type of company it is. You, it, you know, if this were a services company, your expectation would probably be that it's higher than 23%. But again, you want to benchmark it and you, and you want to decide where this should be and then, and then because you feel comfortable with your financial information, that's, that's your number. And the only important thing about that is being able to compare your number to your expectations. Okay. Okay. Same thing with net income. I mean, for a lot of people, right? The, this is the proverb that, you know, at some point, there has to be some performance around return that makes this worthwhile to you as an owner and also meets the expectation of other stakeholders. Okay, so so I think it's self-evident why this particular uh, number is important. It, one way you might look at this is that when you consider all the alternatives of how you might have invested your 100,000 to start this business, were there opportunities to do better than 9.4%? And, and if so, what were they? And what amount of your time would they have absorbed versus what it took to generate this 9.4%? And that, that's about goals and expectations. Okay, I think that's what we have on that. Now, uh, I, you know, on a couple of those slides, we mentioned industry standards, et cetera. The, the SIC codes are essentially about your particular business. And then, and then you can also, there are also these industry classification codes. You guys probably have seen this before and are familiar with it. But there are a number of tools, you know, the, the tool that we, I guess, have used a bit here with SCORE is this Mergent tool. And I actually went in myself just recently, I think it was last week, and, and set up an account. You can set up an account online uh, for the uh, county library system. And then you receive your login information and you're able to go in and then you can pull down and begin to do some 
industry standard information. But because the key thing here is you want to benchmark your, your, your ratios and KPIs are not relevant other than in contrast to others. Okay. Okay. I think this is fair enough. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, if you go to our website, you know, whether you do search or whether you keep this, I mean, we can send these slides to you and you go and click in to this. Our, site, our website, I find to be pretty intuitive uh, in terms of being able to find things, but we've got tons of templates uh, and, uh, and, and advice embedded within templates that are helpful in pulling together your financial statements and your projections. And then, you know, naturally um, that we, we're here and uh, willing to um, serve as mentors. I think that wraps up my, any prepared comments, Paula. So we can take questions. Yeah, this is, this is so great, Ray. I, I was wondering, I'll, and I'm gonna get into the questions here. Would you talk a little bit about, um, about the key performance indicators and how these financial metrics can help folks um, with determining whether or not they're tracking with those? Yes. I, I think with key performance metrics or and indicators, I'm just going to say KPIs because that seems to be the, um, the, the normal term, is that I would start by saying maybe you have you end up with 25 performance indicators. But now let's decide what's key. And now, now we've got KPIs, right? And, I, you know, anything for me, I, I've got to speak for myself. If I've got a dashboard in front of me and it's got more than 10 KPIs on it, I'm diluting my focus, right? So first of all, I would say only, only the business owner can decide with the advice of their, you know, they're, they're gonna have advisors. What, what are those 10 key things that are the indicators of the direction that the business is going in? That, that, such, such that they're early warning types of KPIs and not after the fact types. So that you might be able to look at those and say, okay, we're going astray a little bit here because we, I now can see that my, you know, my uh, uh, cost of sales for the past quarter is 10% more than my expectations. And there's nothing that's changed in the business that I'm aware of, right? So, so that's what I would say is that I would, I would spend a lot of time identifying the KPIs that make the most sense for the business I'm in. And, and I wouldn't overkill it. And I'd make sure I have it in kind of a dashboard format so that I could pull it up, take a look, even have trending so I could see how it looks over weeks or months or whatever period and then use them as something to redirect the business as appropriate and or just to confirm that it's going the way you think it is. Yeah, I think that that's a, a big piece to, you know, honestly just tracking with your overall goals and et cetera with the business. Uh, Barry had a kind of a tag along question here. Can you suggest some simple systems for small business owners to keep track of KPIs without sophisticated systems? I, I mean, a, a lot of, um, I, I, I don't have a particular list. I, I do know that a lot of small business, businesses, they just use uh, QuickBooks Office or QBO because essentially you, you, can, you can dashboard yourself. Once the, the system's pretty intuitive to set up, you, you probably would work with your accountant or bookkeeper or CPA to, to, to set up your accounts, right? From, and, 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 and really the setup process is a narrowing process, right? So you're gonna start out with essentially templates that have just about anything and everything that you might want. 
And all you're doing is deciding what you don't want in your customization. So you set up essentially your accounts and, and, and now you've got information capture at a level that you feel comfortable with. So I'm capturing my debits and credits when I get granular enough in a way that I can feel comfortable that they're going to, they're going to accurately reflect the transactions that are happening from day to day. Let's say I have a point of, of sale uh, type of um, system. Those will feed into QBO. So, and so essentially it posts the sale, it relieves the inventory, et cetera. Okay, so, 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 so once I'm comfortable with that, then it's a question of using the dashboarding and the um, a performance indi indicator um, uh, uh, functionality available there to design what you want to see. And you can, I, I think you can actually push it through your email and or you can just go in there into your account and pull down essentially uh, a, a dashboard reports that you've designed for your use. But I don't, I, I don't have a list myself. I mean, I guess it's, it's a fair question to ask what are a couple different systems that one might use. That's great. And another question um, from David, he said, thank you for volunteering your time. Um, do, you do you recommend any software other than Microsoft? Is there something iOS-based? Yeah, that's, um, th yes, I'm sure there is, but do I have any that I could recommend? No. And I would, you know, I would never try to recommend something unless I knew it very well. Good enough. And um, do you have something specifically, Ray, that you do recommend? No, I do not. Okay. And, okay. I, and I generally have not. And, um, you know, I mean, I've, the, I, I am working with SCORE clients who are using a variety of things that are, for the most part, either you know, uh, 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 Google, you know, uh, uh, products or Microsoft, you know, a uh, web-based sure. uh, kind of things uh, with spreadsheet. The, 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 for a small business, the technology, not so much technology, but the software and the, um, uh, the uh, templates and the uh, spreadsheets and the processors around those are more than sufficient. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's a large amount of tech out there for sure. Um, are you familiar, do you know if the accounting softwares um, such as QuickBooks have um, add-ons for KPIs, et cetera? They, mo most of them, it's, it's not so much add-ons as it's, it's among the functionality is probably the way I would describe it. So in other words, it, it may not be called KPIs, et cetera, but, or, or it may just be called, um, you know, uh, ratios or uh, um, uh, performance indicators, et cetera. But essentially it's, it's using their uh, template driven uh, uh, um, uh, processes to then customize dashboards is essentially how I would look at that. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was, uh, I was chatting with Nabil too, and we were chatting about QuickBooks and he said about 70% of the businesses are using QuickBooks as a, you know, as a, as a tech for that tracking. Um, yeah, I think for small businesses, it's pretty robust. It, it feeds most tax softwares. It, it interacts with directly with your banking yep. product. Um, so it's funny because my direct experience with QuickBooks is in my role. You know, I serve as a treasurer for a uh, a uh, fairly small not for profit. I mean, it's it's reasonably sized, right? It may, may be about two million a year that it does, okay. and has a balance sheet of about 
three and a half to four million. So it's reasonably sized, but still a, a fair, that, that would be a small business, right? Now, so I'm on the board and I'm the treasurer now. And we use, we, we, we have, we have five FTEs. We, we can't, we can't afford to use an FTE on a bookkeeper or a CPA. Sure. So, so what we have is we have a CPA firm that does an annual review and, and issues the financial statements and does the tax return, which is called the Form 990. At the same time, what we do is we have a monthly arrangement with someone who's a QBL QuickBooks expert, and we have the software. And what she does is essentially she does our day-to-day uh, 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 entries, summarization, et cetera, based on having spent time with our staff, our executive director, the finance committee to understand how the look and feel of what we want. What kind of financial reports do we want? What, what types of dashboards do we want to, to measure you know, performance, KPIs, if you will? And we can do it all. And, and at some point, she said to me, well, I can set you up with your user account. And then if you like, you can go in and design whatever it is you want to be reported to you. And it'll be pushed directly to your email. And it's, I mean, these things, are, I, I have not personally worked with it, but it's, it's very good. It's yeah. It's, the system, the system works. is robust and it definitely gives you all of the elements that you, that you've gone through, which is amazing. Um, I had a question from Kristen. She said uh, she's an independent contractor and she hires subcontractors and has other expenses. She's trying to figure out how much money she'll make after taxes and expenses and compare that to um, what she would make as a salaried employee. Is there a template that she could use to make this calculation? Hmm. There, there may not be a template per se, right? That's that specific, right? The, the, the comparison of salary versus what, what a lot of people call 1099ers. Yes. But, but it is a relevant enough question with a lot of small businesses that, I mean, it's, it's often on the table in conversations that I have with clients. And, you know, one, one of the things that we've, been doing is we've been making an assumption about the 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 additional the the, the load beyond salary or wages for an employee for a business especially if it's a small business where the scale that there there isn't as large a scale to spread certain fixed costs associated with being an employer across, right? So, so, so in other words, if, if a large corp has a 25% load beyond salary that, that, that fits the broad cost of benefits and things associated with being an employer, for a small business, maybe it's 30%. And so the consideration would be, okay, I have an option. I'm going to bring on an office manager, and I and I'm going to pay fifty thousand. Then you say, okay, we'll add a thirty percent load to that. Sure. And, and 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 alternatively, right? If you had, you know, what 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 kind of a markup above fifty thousand would an independent contractor expect from you? Because they have to defray those costs themselves if they're going to be a 1099 provider to you. So we go through that exercise pretty regularly. Here, here, here's, why, here's why I say, I don't know that there's necessarily a template that gets you all of your answers. There is a regulatory load associated with being an employer versus a, sub, a contractor with subcontractors that how do you measure it? In a template. And because I think to you, yeah, going back to that, Ray, you know, a lot of times I think people get confused as to what the role of professionals are, especially when it comes to their accountant. You know, the accountants are typically there to provide the statements, 
file the tax forms. They're not there to analyze the results and help you as a business owner and looking at those results and aligning them with your KPIs. That's what SCORE is for. That's what our mentors are here for. So if you need help with that, that's what we're here for. And we have, you know, in addition to mentoring with business planning, developing your KPIs, you know, we have experts that can come in and really truly dive into these financial pieces of your business and help you in analyzing that. So, you know, those kinds of questions, I love when people ask them because it, it, le it lets me shamelessly promote SCORE and, <laughs> and the mentoring that we provide. That's, well, no, for, I think that's, yeah, I think that's great. Or this is well, Greek. Yeah. I think it's great. And I think, um, you know, I, I think on those questions, there, there are both quantitative and qualitative questions associated with, you know, the employee route versus the contractor route. Absolutely. And, and some of those, you know, they just have to be discussed. And then I think, you know, the, the business owner has to decide w where they are in their continuum along, you know, along the road of that particular business and, and, and where is it in its maturity curve? Because there are qualitative factors associated with having employees that you have to be able to find a way to measure those and decide that when you consider the value you get out of it, is it worth that intangible, sometimes not particularly measurable cost associated with maintaining an employee base? Yeah, because some of it becomes strategy driven, right? Goal driven. Yes. You know, where are you driving the business? Where, what are you, what are your long range, long plan goals? I mean, if you're looking to grow a company and, and build a company with employees, then obviously that becomes an easier yes. But if that was never your intent and now you're in the situation, you know, analyzing not only the, the data or the quantitative piece of this and also, you know, the quality, qualitative information. It's kind of like buying a stock, right? You know, you don't just, there are qualitative buyers, but a lot of people don't just look at charts and, and say, yes, we're going to buy that stock. You know, they're going to look at the company too. They're going to look at who's in charge of that company. Are they in a growth phase? So there are a lot of questions that go into really determining how to make that decision. And I think that our mentors are really here um, to help folks with that decision in a more comprehensive manner. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right on point there. And I would I would say as on that one generally, rule of thumb that that you know when I'm talking to especially startup clients is avoid recreating the wheel. I mean, you know, it, to the extent there's something already there, even if it's a contractor, it's probably a better route on the front end. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that you talked about, and I, I wanted to bring this into the fold, um, you talk a, a little bit more about goodwill um, and when and how to add that to the balance sheet of a small business. Yeah, I saw that there. So, yeah. so you know, this, this is always a, a um, tough topic, right? Because the, the accounting rules are very restrictive as to what constitutes goodwill and when and how you can record it. The, the topic of goodwill is broader, right? Because it's what I call inherent value in a business beyond the hard assets. The accounting model is a historical cost model though. So it has limitations. I only say that to say goodwill is recorded because you acquire a business and the book value of the business is less than what you pay for the business. Why would you do that? So in other words, if the net book value of the business is a million and you're willing to pay a million five, why? Goodwill. Goodwill. And, and accumulated inherent uh, ability to generate cash flows in that company beyond the million dollar historical cost number on its books. So when you do that acquisition, remember the accounting equation says assets and liabilities have to equal one another. 
you just bought a company for a million five. So that means now that company's worth a million five. You, you just repriced the company, if you will. It's book value just accreted up to a million five when you write the check. But you can only assign value to what you purchased based on what it was on the books for. So the building has to come over, et cetera, et cetera. Once you bring, once you decide what the fair value is of all the hard assets, if you will, and you bring those into the equation, let's call it, any difference between what you wrote the check for and what you can book those hard assets as, that's goodwill. That's how you can record goodwill. Otherwise, you can't record goodwill in your company because of the accounting model that says debit and credit. You know what I mean? So if your company, let, let's say you had your company appraised, right? For whatever reason, you're just interested. You have it appraised and you realize that, boy, this company, even though my net equity position in the company, assets minus liabilities is a million, my company's worth a million five. Someone made me an offer, let's say, for a million five. Can I record 500,000 as goodwill? No, because there's no transaction that's occurred, okay? So that's all I'm saying. There are limitations to the accounting model and often what your company is inherently worth is, is probably more than what's on your balance sheet. Understood. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, really appreciate all of your insights, Ray, and, and just providing this information to folks, such value, um, and, and glad that we had the opportunity to connect with you and, um, and bring forward this information. Um, folks, if you're interested in getting a mentor, you can jump onto our website. We will be sending out the recording as well as the slides, so you'll have access to that. Um, but if you have further information that you'd like, um, you know, please contact us and tune in for our next event next Wednesday. Um, we're going to be talking more on financial sustainability and really diving into more of private funding sources. So that'll be a really great session, um, which leads into our April series. We'll be talking about angel investors and venture capital and crowds, crowdfunding. So stay tuned for next month. Ray, thank you. Thank you again for all of your assistance and being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Paula. And, and thanks, thanks you guys for your patience as we got through this. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right, dear. Thank you. Take care now.